All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. Our next guest is Kathleen Christensen. She's a counterpuncher over there at counterpunch.org. She's a former CIA political analyst and the author of several books on Palestine, including Palestine in Pieces, co-authored with her late husband, Bill Christensen. Uh, They wrote a great many pieces together at Counterpunch. Uh, He died last year, but she continues to write. Welcome to the show, Kathleen. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, I'm not sure. I'm trying to figure out why I've never talked with you uh, before. Uh, I've been reading uh, you and uh, before that, you and your husband's articles at Counterpunch for years and years. It's always really great stuff, and I'm sorry I never got a chance to talk with him. Uh, But I am very glad to have you here today. I'm glad to be here. Thanks much. Um, Okay, so uh, we got three articles in question here, uh, really two uh, that I want to talk about. The Palestine Papers and what they reveal about the U.S.-Israeli agenda. And uh, the second is WikiLeaks cables on Israel's Gaza onslaught. Uh, First of all, let's talk about these Palestine Papers. Uh, What are they, where do they come from, and where can people find them? Uh, they come from Al Jazeera. Um, you can find them on the uh, on the uh, Al Jazeera website, uh, which I believe is aljazeera.com. Uh, but but you better Google that to make sure. Yeah, it's actually um, .net. .com is dot, the fake that, one. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and uh, these come. These are not WikiLeaks documents. These are not documents released by uh, Julian Assange and and uh, uh, and Bradley Manning and so on. These all come uh, from some Palestinian source, and I don't think anybody knows, or nobody's saying anyway, who released uh, these documents, but there are almost 1,700 of them, all uh, covering a period dating back to a period uh, between 1999 and uh, 2010, fairly late in the year last year, uh, and all having to do uh, uh, directly or indirectly with the so-called peace process uh, between the Palestinians and Israel. And uh, they, what they reveal in brief, uh, by the way, on the, on the Al Jazeera website, there are not only these documents uh, available, but uh, rafts of analysis uh, of them by, uh, by experts like uh, Ali Abu Nima and, uh, golly, many others, and I can't think of any other names, but Ali Abu Nima, who, who himself runs a website called Electronic Intifada, has... Uh, has analyzed, written many articles about these documents, and he he and the other commentators have had access to them for I think months uh, as they sorted through and uh, you know found out which were the interesting articles and and uh, and so on. So so anyway, I would recommend uh, be, people go to the Al Jazeera website to get the whole the whole picture. Mm-hmm. But uh, briefly, uh, what they show is uh, that the Palestinian Authority, that is the leadership of the uh, so-called moderate leadership of the Palestinians, uh, which is in opposition to Hamas, which is in power in Gaza, um, the Palestinian Authority uh, basically was willing to to give away the game, to give away uh, just about every Palestinian demand and every give in on every Palestinian grievance to Israel. And the Israelis still thumbed their nose at the Palestinians and said, no, this is not enough. Uh, the Palestinian Authority was uh, willing to uh, cede territory amounting to, I think, something like six, six to seven percent of the West Bank, which is a small territory to begin with, uh, along the border and in the Jerusalem area, cede that territory to Israel uh, in return for uh, getting an equal amount of territory in a much less uh, attractive area uh, along the borders of Gaza, which is a Less fertile, more uh, desolate area. Uh, so it was not a, a not a good trade of, uh, of real estate. And in the area that the uh, areas that the Palestinians were willing to cede to Israel, uh, sit, sit most of the Israeli settlements, uh, particularly around Jerusalem. The Palestinians were willing to give the Israelis uh, sovereignty over the uh, all but one of the large, large uh, Jewish settlements that are in Arab East Jerusalem, as well as other settlements also, uh, totaling uh, the the settlements the Palestinians were willing to cede would 
uh, how, presently house 400,000 of the 500,000 uh, Israeli settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, in other words, 80%. Uh, so they, they were willing to give away prime real estate. Then they also were willing to make huge concessions on the, uh, uh, the Palestinians' right of return, and, which is the, the most fundamental issue uh, in the Palestinian, uh, uh, to the Palestinians. This is, uh, as far as Palestinians are concerned, the fact that uh, there are over 400, I mean, I'm sorry, 4 million, uh, probably around 4.5 million refugees, Palestinian refugees who are, who were themselves expelled or and dispossessed in 1948 when Israel was created, or are their descendants. Uh, the right of return to Palestinians means the, their right to reclaim their houses and land in in uh, uh, inside uh, what is now Israel, uh, or be compensated. <clears throat> and uh, and their Palestinians are willing to negotiate over this. The Israelis have never been, but uh, these papers show that the uh, Palestinian Authority was willing not to negotiate, in other words, to just sort of basically let the problem go, uh, <clears throat> they would have, uh, I think the Israelis offered uh, five, to, to allow the return of 1,000 uh, Palestinian refugees a year for five years. Well, that's 5,000 people. I've seen other reports that indicate it was 10,000 people uh, out of 4.5 million. So, so that's nothing. And the Palestinians were uh, would have uh, given away that right, which is, as I said, the most fundamental uh, grievance of the Palestinians and uh, makes the Palestinian Authority very unpopular. All right, so, so far we have, uh, they basically were willing to give up, the PA was basically willing to give up the right of return. Sounds like they were willing to give up uh, almost all or, or even uh, any more claim on sovereignty over East Jerusalem. Perhaps you can get into better detail about that. And then they were willing to give up basically all the settlements that already exist in the West Bank. They weren't calling for the rollback of any of them. This amounts, it sounds like, to complete unconditional surrender, and the Israelis said it's still not good enough? Yeah, that's right. It was, it was almost complete uh, unconditional surrender. The, the Palestinians did hold out uh, <clears throat> for, uh, uh, for reclaiming the land on which a couple of major settlements uh, sit, uh, Ariel uh, in the north, Male Adumim, which is right outside Jerusalem, and uh, one or two others, uh, which housed a number of settlers also. So, so the Palestinians were wanted to reclaim the the land and the settlements uh, where about a hundred thousand of the uh, 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 of the Israeli of the five hundred thousand Israeli settlers live. So it wasn't total surrender. It was just you could say 99 percent. Yeah, one <laughs> conditional surrender. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the, and as you say, the the Israelis just said no. Uh, Zippy Livni, who was then foreign minister, these were uh, mostly uh, the, what I'm talking about had to do with uh, uh, negotiations going on in 2008. <clears throat> and uh, she just said uh, basically thanks, but no thanks. She even said thank you, but this isn't enough, and uh, which is just incredible. Uh, then there were also cables from uh, 2009 uh, when the Obama administration had come in that show, uh, as did the earlier cables, that the United States sided totally with Israel's demands and kept never pressured Israel uh, and kept uh, the pressure on the Palestinians to make more and more concessions uh, and uh, sort of uh, in a disdainful uh, uh, tone of voice, uh, that, you know, you know, you can't expect to have everything or you can't people are are displaced in countries have been, this has been happening for centuries and you shouldn't worry about this and uh, and so on the the United States had a had a uh, an excuse for undermining just about every Palestinian demand and and was continuing to put pressure on them uh, and as i say this was true both in the Bush administration and in the Obama administration George Mitchell was uh, judging by these papers was no more uh, uh, accommodating or sympathetic to the Palestinians than anybody in the Bush administration had ever been. Hmm. I guess my question for you at this point, Kathleen, is if the Palestinian Authority is basically willing to give up so much like this, uh, and I guess we could go back and talk about what these documents, these Palestine papers reveal about even Camp David back in the year 2000, but if they're willing to give up everything, and uh, the Likud or Kadima types in power in Israel 
will not take yes for an answer, will not take crying uncle for an okay, uh, then then what is it that they want? Is this about greater Israel? We're just at some point uh, the Likud party figures they'll just drive them all into the into Jordan or somewhere or what? I think you're exactly right. It is all about greater Israel. I mean, this has been basically the Zionist objective uh, from the beginning to uh, to make all of Palestine from the Mediterranean to the Jordan into a Jewish state, which means no non-Jews, certainly not many of them, uh, and not in any po- you know in any position of power. Uh, which is why uh, the Palestinians, 750,000 of them, were expelled and dispossessed. By Israel in 1948, when the when the Israeli state was created, and uh, they've been very patient. They, the Zionists and the Israeli government, have been very patient. But uh, their basic objective is uh, not to give the Palestinians to avoid giving the Palestinians any significant control anywhere in Palestine. So, if there ever is a two-state solution uh, coming out of this so-called peace process, which is now basically dead which means that there won't be a two-state solution. But the the best I think the Palestinians could ever have expected out of the Israelis was a state in pieces. That was actually the title of my husband's and my uh, most recent book, Palestine in Pieces, uh, a, uh, a state uh, of little cantons separated by roads that were accessible only by Israeli uh, Israelis and Israeli settlers who are distinguished from Palestinians <clears throat> because they have different color license plates and uh, broken up by uh, Israeli settlements all over the West Bank and so on. And I think that this retention of this territory uh, and certainly retention of, of uh, effective control over the whole territory has been the Israeli objective. Well, no, I, I can't beginning. remember how I ever got this idea, Kathleen, but somehow I believed that in – kind of popular discussion in Israeli politics that this was no longer a credible position to take, that this was like the right-wingest crazies believed in this greater Israel thing, and that most Israelis didn't want that and wanted a solution to, a, you know, a peaceful one uh, to the Palestinian problem yeah. uh, rather than some giant forced march into Jordan. Well, there is uh, there there are different strains of Israeli thinking, uh, and this was, uh, for instance, Itzhak Rabin's uh, thought, finally, when he started to negotiate and began the, uh, he and the Palestinians, uh, began the Oslo peace process in the early 90s, uh, because I think uh, uh, the, the left, uh, so-called, uh, <clears throat> in Israel, represented by Rabin and the Labor Party, which is now almost totally defunct, both the left and the Labor Party are, are almost totally defunct, but I think Rabin and company thought that uh, the, that the Palestinians were getting to be so numerous and uh, and so uh, obstreperous. There had just been uh, in, from the late 80s through the into the early 90s uh, an, another intifada uh, by the Palestinians, an uprising which was very hard for the Israelis to control because it was totally nonviolent. The only violence involved was uh, were some stones thrown by Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, I think began to think th- those Israelis on the left. Uh, who were then more powerful and more numerous than the right wing in Israel, began to think that the only way to get any kind of peaceful resolution uh, might might mean that they would have to relinquish control over some territory. I don't think that Rabin ever thought of, of giving the Palestinians all of the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem for a state, which is the only the only possible uh, way that the Palestinians could have a viable state. Uh, and Rabin himself, uh, you know, delayed on all of the uh, the various timetables in the Oslo peace process. And then, of course, he was assassinated by the right wing, by a right winger. And ever since then, Israel has been moving more and more inexorably rightward. And now they don't even hide. They don't even hide it. Uh, and the left has been so uh, emasculated uh, uh, for various reasons. Uh, because they're 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 afraid, or they claim to be afraid of of you know Palestinian terror, suicide bombers, rocket attacks from Gaza, and so on. So the population has moved more and more to the right, which is why we have a the most <clears throat> uh, radically right wing government uh, in Israel's history, which, as I said, doesn't even try to hide its racist its racist impulses and its racism, its racist policies. 
Mm-hmm. All right, uh, now, so. I'm sorry, we're short on time here, and there's a couple more things I want to get yeah. to. Maybe we'll only have time for one. Can you tell us about uh, your article here uh, is called WikiLeaks Cables on Israel's Gaza Onslaught. I encourage everybody to go read that at counterpunch.org. But can you tell us about what's learned about the Israeli war against the Gaza Strip in December 08 and January 09? What uh, these cables, uh, this is a, an article based on three cables released by WikiLeaks. Uh, <clears throat> about a uh, visit by a, a U.S. Uh, under, I mean, Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama administration who went to Israel in uh, uh, just about a year ago, in January of 2010, uh, a year after the uh, Gaza assault ended and a year after Obama took office. And what these three cables reveal is more about uh, U.S. the U.S. attitude toward Israel and the U.S. impulse to protect Israel then it, uh, it, it isn't, uh, they don't reveal anything in particular about the, the actual assault, uh, uh, except that the Israeli generals with whom this assistant secretary of state uh, met repeatedly, uh, uh, the, all of the top brass, brass of the Israeli military, um, uh, w- continued to make excuses. This is after the Goldstone report had come out, uh, I guess about four months after it had come out, the Israelis denied everything that the Goldstone report uh, said about what about Israel's conduct during this war. The Goldstone report concluded that the Israelis had uh, committed war crimes, that Hamas had also committed some war crimes, but the Israelis much more so. Um, and uh, and the Israelis were denying that in these, these meetings with uh, with the uh, U.S. Assistant Secretary. And what's most interesting about them is that the assistant secretary himself, a guy named Michael Posner, was help, trying to help the Israelis improve their international image, urging them to uh, you know, conduct some kind of investigation so it'll look as though you're trying to look into these uh, things and so on, but basically to put out a better, uh, make a better propaganda effort on their own behalf. He was acting like a spin coach on behalf of the Israelis. He claimed that the Goldstone report uh, is, was flawed, uh, was not true, and that much of the international criticism of Israel because of the assault was also uh, unfair and disproportionate, which, of course, is absurd. So mm-hmm. this was the U.S. again siding with Israel. All right. Well, uh, this has really been great. I hope we can do it again, Kathleen. Thank you very much. I do, too. Everybody, that's Kathleen Christensen. She's a counterpunch. Her, her most recent book is Palestine in Pieces. Uh, Check out counterpunch.org for the Palestine Papers, what they reveal about the U.S.-Israeli agenda.